In today's video, let's review sections 8.5 through 8.7 of AP Biology on Community Ecology. Hey guys, this is Mikey from Able Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover AP Bio content. In today's video, we're going to be moving forward onto community ecology in our review of this final unit of AP Bio. In ecology, we have a nested hierarchy of systems that show the scale and scope of our inquiry. As this image shows, we're now moving on from assessing characteristics of populations, as we did in our previous video, and moving on to understanding how these very populations of various species can interact within a similar geographical area. And as such, we can define community as a group of populations from different species living close enough to interact. Note that we do not primarily include impacts from abiotic features of a system in our analysis of communities. But in this chapter 54 of Campbell Biology, there are several major topics we do need to know, and they are as follows. 1. Interspecific interactions. 2. Symbiosis. 3. Community diversity, and 4. Disturbances and their effects. Let's explore each of these topics in that very order. As the name suggests, interspecific interactions refer to the ways in which different species interact with each other in nature. As you can imagine, there are so many direct and indirect interactions, but here we're going to focus on identifying and understanding some of the most direct relationships. And in many of these cases, we can even use a notation like this one to indicate either a positive benefit or a negative harm incurred upon the two species involved in that interaction. So let's begin with competition. Competition is typically thought of as a negative-negative relationship, meaning that both species are harmed. In ecology, we generally see competition for resources in our finite environment between species that are relatively similar in their niche. Niche, of course, is the particular role an organism plays in its environment, meaning that two species who generally do the same thing are going to compete against each other. But unlike in the real world where some competition can mean cheaper prices for consumers, there are no winners in competition in ecology. In fact, what we typically see playing out is something called competitive exclusion. In competitive exclusion, one of the two competing species that has even a slight edge over the other, be it being more efficient, resourceful, or otherwise, would outcompete and exclude the less competitive species in that community. This was demonstrated by Gary Gauss with two species of Paramecia, who often appear on this AP exam. Next, let's take a look at predation. In this positive and negative relationship, we have one of the most fundamental biological processes happening, the struggle for survival through consumption of other biological entities. And while the idea of predation is fairly intuitive, there are a few very interesting phenomena that arise from this relationship. First, let's discuss the dynamics of predator-prey populations. In what we call the Lotka volterra predator prey model, we see the population of predator and prey in sine curves, but one slightly displaced against the other. The rationale is simple. When the prey population is high, the predators have more access to food, so their population tends to increase as a response. But when the predator population becomes too high, they exert more pressure against the prey, and as a result, that decreases the prey population. But when the prey population declines, there's less food for the predators, resulting in the predator population population decreasing. This naturally eliminates the predation pressure, increasing that prey population back up again. This process would repeat over and over again. Now, the model's name sounds fancy, but it sort of totally makes sense. So there's all this eating and getting eaten happening, and both predators and prey have come up with some numerous mechanisms to improve their chances of survival. Here, we see cryptic coloration in both predators and prey as a means to avoid visual detection, though we typically refer to this feature as a means to hide from predators, like this canyon frog here. Other species take a slightly different route. Instead of hiding, they produce toxic chemicals to deter their predators. Many of these toxic or noxious or venomous species advertise their danger through something called aposmetic coloration. Also known as having warning coloration, these organisms typically have bright and flamboyant patterns which are markers of danger, which are also easily recognized by predators as such. And what's really fascinating is that these warning colorations are often shared by similarly dangerous species. This is what we call Mullerian mimicry, and examples include the monarch butterfly and the viceroy, both of which are toxic. But it wouldn't be a evolution without its cheaters. In Batesian mimicry, we see non-toxic or harmless species mimicking the appearance of a dangerous species. 
This strategy can help the cheater by receiving free protection without having to make the expense of toxins themselves. Here we see the drone fly mimicking the look of a bee or a wasp with their yellow and black banding. Drone flies, of course, don't have stingers and rely solely on this fakeness to defend themselves. And while we're on the topic of predation, I like to add herbivory into the mix as well. Even though herbivory involves herbivores and plants, it's still the same type of plus and minus relationship that results in many similar evolutionary aspects adaptations. For instance, the production of nicotine or caffeine by plants was, after all, a mode of defense against their perceived predators. Now let's move on to symbiosis. Symbiosis includes a set of very specific interspecific interactions derived from direct and intimate relationships typically based on some evolutionary history and development. We can still use the same plus and minus convention here, which actually is more important in understanding the things that we need to know for the course. Here, we need to be aware of three major symbiotic relationships, parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. In parasitism, we see a plus and a minus relationship, but with a slight twist, as parasites require their host for survival, it's not in their best interest to outright kill the host. Of course, this is not a guarantee, as some parasites might just go a little bit overboard. But in any case, we see two major types of parasites, ectoparasites that live on the outside of an organism, like lice and ticks, or endoparasites, like hookworms and tapeworms. I'm totally not going to show you any pictures of these, just in case you're eating while you're studying. What's crazy about many of these parasites, though, is that they've evolved specifically to parasitize their hosts, or in some cases, several hosts during some of the most complex life cycles we see in biology. For instance, Taxoplasma gondii, a eukaryotic parasite, can reside in cats, mice, and even humans during some parts of their life cycle. Here we see some insane adaptations, such as making the infected mice less afraid of cats, such that it would be eaten to help the parasite continue its cycle onwards. In mutualism, we observe a mutually beneficial relationship or a positive-positive interaction between two species. Some major examples common on the exam include corals and algae, as corals provide shelter and nutrients, while algae photosynthesizes to provide corals with sugars. We also see another great example in legumes who develop root nodules that can harbor nitrogen-fixing bacteria that provide this limiting nutrient for the plants while receiving sugars in return. Also, don't forget flowers and their pollinators, which, as you may be aware, is not only mutualism, but a great example of co-evolution, which involves both the plants and the pollinators developing features that match each other specifically. Last, we have commensalism. In this positive and zero relationship, we see one species benefiting while the other is neither benefiting nor harmed. A notable example is cowbirds who often hang out near bisons who are grazing the grass. As bisons stir up insects from the grass and the ground, cowbirds swoop in and eat those insects. So here, bisons aren't really all that bothered, while the cowbirds are clearly benefiting from this activity. Now that we've looked at a ton of interspecific relationships and symbiosis, let's have a brief discussion on the overall community structure, and specifically its diversity. When it comes to species diversity, I think it's important to acknowledge that communities with greater diversity is generally more robust and resilient against the collapse of that system. The reason is quite similar to why genetic variation is important in your offspring as well as within populations. Greater diversity means that there are many species that have carved out niches for themselves in the complexity of the system. From primary producers all the way up to the high-level consumers, we should expect to see many species occupying each step of the way. This means that even if one species were to go locally extinct, there will be fail-safes and redundancies in each level to keep the community going. It also turns out that diverse communities, due to their complexities, can be harder to invade for invasive species. So now now that we know why species diversity is important, let's talk about two factors that actually account for that measure. While many mistake species diversity as simply the number of species in a community, it's actually a little bit more complex than that. This image shows that the number of species in both systems is identical. This is what we call the species richness. However, in comparing the two systems, the species evenness is quite different with a more even relative abundance of the species in the left system versus the right system. As such, both species richness and evenness must be taken into account
account when assessing the species diversity of a community. In order to do this, biologists often use indices of species diversity. The two major indices for this exam include Shannon Index and the Simpson Index, with the latter being a little bit more common on the test. I won't necessarily go into a sample question here, as I've not seen too many calculation questions on this very topic in any recent exam standards, but you never know. So I'll ask some more information in the description below. Now, earlier I did mention invasive species. So let's take a few moments to talk about those as well. Invasive species are exotic species, not endemic to the environment in which they are found. As you might expect, these species arrive at their new environment mostly due to human activities. Now, whether it be a seed in an ecologist's shoe or soil in the ballast of a transatlantic ship, what's important is that not all species are invasive, but some can be extremely and aggressively invasive. So over the years, scientists have identified certain traits and other reasons as to why they're so successful in this new environment. First, invasive species tend to be fast growers with rapid reproduction. This allows them to be very opportunistic, taking over areas before the native species can set their roots. Secondly, invasive species tend to escape their native predators or herbivores as they move to a new area. This idea called the enemy release hypothesis is thought to have a pretty big impact on the success of invaders. Some common examples include plants like garlic mustard and purple loosestrife, while animal examples include the European starling that have become quite a problem in eastern North America. Now, another special type of species we need to know about are keystone species. Now, keystone species are those that have disproportionately large impacts on the community structure. And when keystone species are removed, we see drastic changes in the species composition and sometimes even the collapse of a community. Some representative examples include starfish, which play an important role in being the only species that could really control bivalve populations like those of clams and mussels. Without starfish, these bivalves can go insanely out of control. Another is beavers for their dams. Without the dams, the entire system would change beyond recognition. Finally, we arrive at our final topic, disturbances to the community. In this part, we begin to think about the stability of communities across time. For instance, imagine a mature oak forest or miles and miles of grassy plains. For many decades, ecologists believed that these communities were stable, having reached their climax status and staying put that way. More recently, it has been discovered that all communities do experience disturbances such as natural disasters or human activities that could reset its biotic and abiotic factors. And some communities actually require disturbances to stay put. For many centuries, Aboriginal peoples of North America would periodically burn tall grass prairies to maintain them. In fact, without periodical burning, these grasslands would often be taken over by shrubs and trees, no longer able to sustain the numerous animals that depended on the grasses. In fact, we still perform controlled burnings to maintain grasslands in North America. Now, this is an example of what we call the intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Under this idea, we see that communities with moderate levels of disturbances harbor more species diversity than those with low or very high disturbances. This actually makes sense as too many disturbances would make it incredibly hard for any species to settle, while too few disturbances would give opportunities for certain dominant species to simply take over the whole place as its own. So that's all good for looking at disturbance in a relatively short period of time. But what about across longer timeframes? Here, let's take a look at our final topic of the final topic, which is ecological succession. Here, we're talking about the recovery of that relatively climax community from a large scale disturbance. And both primary succession and secondary succession share a lot in common except the point for from which they begin. See, in primary succession, a system begins with no soil, or rather exposed bedrock. This could occur from a glacial retreat or a volcanic eruption that lays down a new bedrock. Here, the first thing that needs to occur is the creation of that soil. As such, we begin with lichens and mosses that start the process of weathering the rocks down to usable soil. Grasses come in next, followed by shrubs, which that normally sees a lot of animals starting to come in, bringing the additional nutrients as they die and decompose. Trees eventually come in, the fast-growing, less competitive kinds first, eventually to be replaced by competitive, long-lived tree species like sugar maples, beeches, and oaks. In secondary succession, we usually see the system experiencing disasters like floods or fires, but that which leaves the soil intact. So here, we simply see grasses moving in first, followed by 
pretty much everything that we saw in primary succession. The important thing to note here though, is that each stage alters the system slightly to make it a little bit more favorable for the next stage of events to occur. Now this isn't necessarily for the sake of the next organisms, but simply the way that biology plays out. Now with that, we've pretty much covered everything that we need to know for community ecology. Short of solving diversity index equations, of course, this is a pretty big section with a lot of separate but interconnected ideas. So I would still advise reading through chapter 54 to get all the details that you might need to know for your school exam. But for the AP bio exam in May, you should be pretty well set if you understood everything that I've mentioned in this video. Hey, if you found this video useful, be sure to click that like button and subscribe to this channel for more content just like this one. And most importantly, be sure to share it with Jenny. She needs the help. This has been Mikey with Able Prep Academy. We'll see you in the next video.